Welcome and good evening. This is uh, welcome to the 390th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. This is a weekly lecture series on comics, animation, illustration, and other text image work. It's funded by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation and the New School, where we are live tonight and streaming over there for our online audience. And our guest tonight is Nina Rowe. Uh, and Nina is a professor of medieval art history at Fordham University. Her books include The Jew, The Cathedral and the Medieval City, Synagoga and Ecclesia in the 13th Century, and The Illuminated World Chronicle, Tales from the Late Medieval City as well as co-edited volumes, most recently, Who's Middle Ages? Teachable Moments for an Ill-Used Past. She has held fellowships from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the American Council of Learned Societies. And she served as president of the International Center of Medieval Art from 2020 to 2023. And tonight's talk is entitled Word and Image in Medieval Manuscripts, the Story of Emperor Nero. So welcome to Nina. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you for those of you who are in person. Thanks for coming out on um, such a beautiful evening, um, so coming inside <laughs> and rather than staying out. Um, and also just, I want to, it's just, a, to, I just want to let you know, it's a delight to be here, to be presenting in the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. I'm really grateful to Ben Catcher for the invitation and to Austin English for handling the tech and all of you in the Zoomosphere also for coming. So let's get started. Um, my screen has changed a little, um, oh, so we're going to yeah. try. You can go ahead. It's just not okay. Thing, but, but it's the same thing. Okay. okay. All right. So, and you are set there, showing good. Yes. Super. Okay. These days, it is hard to open a newspaper or to go to a news website without encountering a piece addressing current debates over the teaching of history in the U.S. Now, whatever one might think about the level of this discourse as it plays out in civic chambers or on TV news, in the simplest terms, those of us who study the cultural past can find some solace in a broad societal awareness of the constructed nature of all historical narratives. There are not simply facts to be conveyed, but stories and modes of telling and analysis that bring meaning to facts. This observation, of course, pertains not only to 21st century issues, but to the way that people have made sense of historical characters and episodes throughout time. A high profile case in point is Nero. In the popular imagination, Emperor Nero often figures as a stock embodiment of an abominable ruler, a perverse and eccentric character who killed Christians and fiddled while Rome burned. Such conceptions are manifest fairly consistently in Victorian paintings and Hollywood cinema and Warner Brothers cartoons, as exemplified in the images on the screen. There has, however, been a recent push to recuperate the reputation of Nero. In summer 2021, there was a blockbuster exhibition on the ruler at the British Museum in London. Here, the curator sought to debunk the popular conception of the emperor, to reveal what they build to be the man behind the myth, observing that it was vituperative ancient texts written in the generations after Nero's demise that cast the ruler as a tyrannical megalomaniac and that he actually was quite popular in his day. The surprise expressed 
by audiences in response to this recasting, however, underscores the fixedness of the image of Nero as a cruel and insolent ruler. The pervasiveness of that view suggested by headlines of reviews of the British Museum exhibition. It is hard, that is, to recalibrate narratives about heroes or villains of long ago if people have learned since grade school that this or that historical figure was wicked or a rogue or would not tell a lie. But it is worthwhile for us to be receptive to, even to seek out the various, sometimes surprising ways in which people may have made sense of characters and stories from the past, because these can enrich our understanding of the ways in which culture meets the needs of its makers. Now, returning to Nero, there is some consistency in how he has been portrayed over the centuries. Indeed, folks have long been gripped by notions of Nero as a salacious tyrant who was dissolute in the extreme. The second century CE texts of Suetonius and Tacitus that render Nero as a corrupt sadist provided formulas that were repeated and recast in Christian moralizing terms in the medieval works of, for instance, the sixth century philosopher Boethius or John of Salisbury in the 12th century and Thomas Aquinas in the 13th, among others. And I dropped in an image of Boethius there from a 15th century um, Austrian manuscript just to invoke that translation. And such conceptions of philosophers and churchmen entered the vernacular sphere in the High Middle Ages in works such as the Romance of the Rose and in Middle High German compositions known as the Kaiser Pony and the Weltkönigin or World Chronicles. Recently, I published a book on illuminated uh, World Chronicle or Weltkönig manuscripts that Dan mentioned in his intro. Um, and this genre was particularly popular in the southern region of the Holy Roman Empire in the late Middle Ages. And I focused on 24 extant manuscript witnesses from the Bavarian Austrian corridor between circa 1330 and 1430. And you're looking at examples of pages from such manuscripts now. Of those 24 illuminated World Chronicle manuscripts, 10 of them feature expansive sections on the crimes of Nero. But turning to the theme of the packaging of history, the stories told about Nero in illuminated world chronicles are surprising and depart drastically from common narratives repeated in standard histories and popular culture. To demonstrate this in my discussion this evening, I will focus on the textual and pictorial cycles featuring Nero in two illuminated world chronicle manuscripts. The work represented on the screen on the left um, a codex uh, created in the first decade of the 15th century, now at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles, and the work depicted at the right, a page from a book dated to 1402 and now in the Spencer Collection of the New York Public Library, or the NYPL. And I've tried to capture the relative scale of these two manuscripts in the slide. Uh, you can see the dimensions for each also on the screen, but for the sake of visualization, imagine books that are coffee table size books, several inches thick and unwieldy and heavy, needing the support of a table or a lectern. And you can see in the slide that the um, Getty manuscript is slightly larger and more unwieldy in its scale. The Getty localizes their manuscript to the city of Regensburg. And the NYPL codex also appears to have been made in an urban workshop in Bavaria with Regensburg, a likely candidate as a site for production. Here I'm getting closer on the illuminations we've been looking at. And you can see that in these pictures, Nero is engaged in acts that conform to his dastardly reputation. At the left, the emperor is singled out by his crown, and he first oversees the murder of his tutor, the man who was slouching naked in the tub, and then he takes a knife to the womb of his mother, the aged woman propped up diagonally on a board. In the New York manuscript shown on the right, 
The mother's garment has been drawn back to fully reveal her bare flesh, here sliced open to satisfy the curiosity of Nero, who stands in the foreground, his own solidly intact state underscored by the tight seal of his pink cloak. And it is the scene on the right half of that two-part image on the right of the screen that inaugurates the drama at the heart of my discussion this evening. Here we see Nero engaged in an exchange with a cluster of men, and the accompanying text reveals what they're chatting about. Here I give you the transcription of the Middle High German verses that appear above and below the vignette um, taken from the critical edition of the text where the spellings diverge slightly from what you see in the manuscript. Then I also give you a translation, and I'll address this text per se in a moment, but uh, what Nero is talking about there, once he gets all these learned men together, well, he asks that they find a way to make him pregnant. Now, I'll explore how this tale plays out in due course, but first I want to take a few minutes to explain the illuminated Belconic genre overall, its character and anticipated audiences because this book type is not far afield from the kinds of entertaining historical narratives that circulate today. Stories that creatively use the past as raw material to address contemporary concerns. First off, uh, having the text up on the screen now gives me an opportunity to underscore the liveliness of the Belconi verses. Uh, so I'm gonna read the text out in Middle High German. You can just listen to this or the rhythm of it. Danach sand er Rat in das Land und in die Stadt. Nach Meistern und nach Erzat, wir kommen zwein und siebzig Rat. So the rhyme scheme that you just heard with those tidy couplets, as well as internal references in the text, make plain that the verses were meant to be read aloud. And the simple rhythms of the meter invited listeners to nod their heads along or to tap a foot. And going further, the rhyming verse easily could be set to the rhythm of a drum or to melodies plucked on a lute when these manuscripts were read aloud. And those zippy verses were packaged in illustrated books that enhanced the entertainment value of the tales. So now I move to other examples of Beltoni manuscripts beyond those exemplars at the Getty and the NYPL just to fill out the picture of the genre. Illuminated World Chronicles were best sellers in the late Middle Ages. 56 manuscript witnesses survived in total, and it seems that the book type had its heyday in the regions of Bavaria and Austria in the 14th and early 15th centuries. These manuscripts tend to be richly adorned, usually with about 250 images, evenly spaced over 300 or so folios. And one typically sees heavily illustrated page openings, often with images clustered, like those on the left of the screen now. The narrative cycles in illuminated Belconic manuscripts are expansive and discursive. They begin with tales from Genesis and Exodus, continuing on with accounts of Old Testament rulers, but then interweaving these with tales from Greco-Roman mythology, sometimes injecting folksy accounts of the life of the Virgin and Christ, and continuing on with legends of rulers and heroes. All of these kinds of stories counted as history for late medieval audiences. That is, there simply was not a distinction between what we might think of as literary formulations on the one hand, and on the other, the often dry accountings of dates and battle tactics or constitutional crises that we might remember from seventh grade social studies, or you know, the things that we were taught were are count as history. And the images in the current slide hint at the ways in which biblical, mythological, and epic tales were recast in illuminated Balkonian. At the left are depictions of the children of Adam and Eve, not just the expected Cain and Abel, but an expansive brood, including Enoch and Jubal and Tubal-Cain, offered up as founders of city living 
and the trades and diversions that enliven urban existence. In the center are episodes connected to the story of the judgment of Paris with Hector and Peleus in combat, outfitted like two late medieval knights at this at a time when members of the Berber ranks of cities increasingly sought to participate in tournaments. And at the right are details from an enormous manuscript now in Berlin. In these illustrations, you can get a sense of the entertaining quality of the pictures in Illuminated Gulf Point again with a depiction of the earth swallowing the Israelites, Dathan and Abiram, bottoms bare to the sky. And you also see a romantic scene of Wilhelm, who is lifted from the epic by Wolfram von Eschenbach, playing chess as he courts the princess Carabel. Now, as I've mentioned already, stories in illuminated world chronicles are told in Middle High German the language of the street, of everyday interactions, as opposed to the Latin of the church. And they are in rhymed verse, as you know already from my brief recitation of that snippet from the Nero section a few minutes back. But what about that text? Who wrote it, you may be asking. Now, there's not one individual poet who wrote a fixed world chronicle text appearing in all of the illuminated manuscripts of the genre. Rather, most of the illuminated Gulf Chroniken are pastiches of verse composed by several authors. The name most frequently associated today with the Gulf Chronik genre is Rudolf von Ems, and that is an author portrait of Rudolf von Ems from a circa 1300 manuscript on screen now. Rudolf dictates while his assistant transcribes. But Rudolf never completed the expansive historical text he set out to compose, and most illuminated World Chronicle manuscripts intersperse and extend Rudolf's account with compositions by two other authors, known as the Chris Perra poet and Janse Eniko, who worked in the mid and later 13th century, and you can see their dates on the screen. And then there are other later recensions of the World Chronicle text that weave together passages from these three poets or rewrite sections and then enhance those four accounts with further excerpts from contemporary poets. The text in the manuscripts I consider this evening from the Getty and the NYPL are composed of passages by Rudolf von Ems, the Chris Terra poet, Janser Enikel, and other authors, though the sections on Nero in these codices all were penned by Jans de Enikel. And so I will refer to Jans throughout my discussion and cite verses from the critical edition of his work. In illuminated Velconic manuscripts, expansive sequences of pictures smooth over shifts in authorial tone and punch up the dynamic and amusing elements of the narratives. And overall, what we see here are stories of the past packaged to meet the tastes of the late medieval present, splashy new productions in a decidedly contemporary register. A Hamilton or a Bridgerton story for 14th and early 15th century reader viewers. These tales were consumed not in theaters or on screens, but in the domestic abodes of high-ranking urban dwellers, upper echelon burghers who prospered in trade, property owners who made up the patrician estate, or lower nobles. And I'm putting up images that evoke the milieu of these original owners. A view of Nuremberg from a hill overlooking the city at the left, and a couple of shots of urban palaces that survived in Regensburg in the center and on the right. These mansions were owned by rich merchant and entrepreneurial families and help us to imagine the kinds of settings in which illuminated Welt Chroniken initially were consumed. That is, it appears that the original reader viewers of illuminated world chronicles were folks who thrived in the expanding urban arenas of the late Middle Ages. Those who bet big on commercial enterprises like long distance trade or the textile industry, ventures evoked in Welt Chronik illuminations like those on the screen now and people who assumed positions of power within the urban sphere, particularly through participation in municipal governance, 
ser serving in the city rock or the municipal council. As I mentioned already, the Getty and NYPL manuscripts both can be convincingly localized to Regensburg, and that city will be the focus of my remarks this evening. Put another way, I'm committed to what we can call a social history of art. As I see it, it is not enough to look at images and texts together to try to recover attitudes and aspirations of the past in a general way. Cultural productions like Illuminated Weltkoniken were deeply implicated in the daily lives of their original reader viewers. And so I aim to get as close as possible to the specific material conditions in which those original audiences live. That said, late medieval municipal and economic conditions similar to those in Regensburg prevail in other urban centers of the regions of Bavaria and Austria, Nuremberg and Vienna in particular. So my remarks pertain in broader terms to urban attitudes circa 1400, whether or not the original owners of the manuscripts under consideration actually resided in Regensburg itself. Okay, so let's get down to the images and the texts of the story of Nero in our two examples, the manuscripts now and the Getty and the NYTL. Well, today it is a commonplace to invoke Nero's debauchery through reference to his disinterested fiddling, as Rome was destroyed by fire, or his slaying of the apostles Peter and Paul, that is, atrocities that I invoke at the opening of this paper. Those crimes are not referenced outright in Janska and Ethel's first text, nor are they illustrated in the Getty and NYPL Bill 20 manuscript. Instead, the main action begins with the ruler ordering the vivisection of his mother so that he can see with his own eyes the womb in which he gestated, referenced in the text on the screen. And I use this comparison to flag the distinction in pictorial style between the Getty and the New York manuscripts. The NYPL codex is made of paper and its wash images are rendered with loose and dynamic brushwork in muted colors, creating a dreamy and lyrical tone. The Getty manuscript is in the traditional medium of tempera on parchment, and the heavily laid on paint creates compositions that have a dramatic intensity, as evident in the foreboding fall of the blackened background of the scene on the left. In the Velconi text, as I mentioned already, directly after delving into his mother's uterus, Nero calls upon a squad of 72 masters and doctors and asks if they, in their wisdom, can help him to bear a child, just as he was nurtured in the womb, offering silver and gold if they can do it. And that offer is spelled out in the final two lines up there on the screen. Uh, das Ich ein Kind gebären sollt, ich gebe euch Silber und Gold. In the Getty manuscript, in that, in that Getty manuscript image that you're looking at, a coterie of learned men address the ruler through the interme intermediary figure of a courtier decked out in red. With heads turned in various directions and hands gesticulating, the doctors seem to buzz with consternation over how to respond to the ruler's request. The master at the left exudes calm competence and wears an ermine-lined robe with profuse sleeves, a marker of his wealth, manifest further in his finely groomed beard and mustache. Others in the crowd seem to be more agitated by Nero's wishes, with hair standing on end. The sages judge that it would be womanly and not right for any man to experience childbirth, and for their insubordination, Nero has the doctors thrown in prison. In order to win release, the wise men come up with a plan to appease the truculent ruler, mixing a potion that will result in pregnancy. Not, however, with a child, but with a toad. And the fact is, I taunt not seinem Geburt, als das in ihm wird ein Krot. 
Nero remains oblivious to this reality and delights in his newly expectant condition, becoming all aglow with the feeling of the child moving inside his body. And the doctors keep up the ruse, continuing to monitor Nero and appeasing his jitters with inspections of his urine and other staples of the medical trade. Eventually, however, the doctors apparently feel honor-bound to reveal to Nero that the creature that stirs within him is not a baby, but a toad. Der Zagen übt das offenbar, dass ihr ein Toten wart. So this is the kind of dialogue that is experienced. And soon thereafter, they give him a drink that results in the birth of a little beast. It's easy to imagine the delight that this account of crafty doctors outmaneuvering one of history's great villains might bring to Belconi audiences. And those in late medieval cities had particular reason to cheer on the doctors in the tale, since such reader viewers lived at a moment of increased professionalization of the medical trade and at a time when burghers were assuming the authority to oversee and orchestrate the institutions that tended to be ill. And here I'm showing you a personification of medicine from a 15th century Middle High German medical manuscript. Just to set the mood, though I won't be dealing directly with this rendering. In the Southern German realm, circa 1400, there was a range of types of practitioner of the medical arts. There were university-educated physicians, men typically trained in Bologna or Padua, who, over the course of the 15th century, came to be recognized as masters in a trade of high honor. These men were members of the professional spheres, though I note that in the centers like Regenburg or Nürnberg, merchants and entrepreneurs retained their position at the peak of the urban hierarchy. And as leading citizens, such tradesmen and masters of industry began to take it upon themselves to see to the health of the community, establishing foundations for urban welfare, including hospitals. Nuremberg's Heilig Geistetal, which is now on the screen, is a well-known example. It was founded in the 1330s by Conrad Gross, a scion of a family that became immensely wealthy through trade, real estate, and copper mining. In Regensburg, there was a similar foundation under Burger administration by the 14th century, the St. Catherine Spital, and you're looking at a rendering of it in its pre-modern profile. Now, the kinds of top-tier burghers who owned illuminated Velconiken may have taken pride in their ability to subsidize city hospitals, but they had other places to look when tending to their own medical needs. For these kinds of institutions on the screen were not hospitals in the modern sense of the word. They were more like hospices, focused on care for the poor and for the old and infirm. The wealthy, for their part, relied sometimes on university-educated doctors or on apothecaries and other specialists, offering cures which blur the boundaries of what today would be classified as medicine and magic and spiritual healing. A profusion of vernacular medical books survives from the 14th and 15th centuries, and they reveal how practitioners relied on the curative properties of plants, minerals, and animals to heal or to provide comfort. On the screen now is an opening from a 13th century Middle High German manuscript on the cultivation and use of the verbena plant. The text explains that one must activate the plant by leaving it overnight encircled by pure silver and gold, recite the Paternoster and the Credo in its presence, and before sunrise, dig up the roots. Our Belconic reader viewers might have imagined verbena as the kind of thing that the doctors would have offered Nero when they determined that it was time for him to give birth. For this plant was said to be useful for women who are about to go into labor. And that those who pour a sprig of it between the breasts could anticipate an uncomplicated delivery. In this illumination from the New York manuscript, Nero seems to have gotten through the birthing rather well, 
and his offspring looks quite healthy as it takes its first breaths. But it is the lady who holds the little toad who is treated with particular dignity. She is the newborn's nurse, and the artist here suggests the lady's grace and competence at handling her new charge. She stands in a casual contraposto, cradling the critter. The mildness of her demeanor evident, evident particularly in comparison to the wide-eyed unease of the nurse in this rendering on the left of the same scene in a manuscript now in Thomas Feldman. The calm mood of the NYTL image echoes aspects of the bodily arts which were central to the preservation and functioning of human communities throughout history, the work and essential role of female midwives. And now I'm going to take out that rather unsettling image from Thomas Feldman and focus in on the nurse in the NYTL manuscript as we explore the theme of midwives as it pertains specifically to Reagan's work. For in the first part of the 15th century, the citizens of Regensburg sorted out clear and detailed expectations and provisions for women engaged in childbirth and postpartum care. These regulations are recorded in an ordinance issued by the Regensburg City of Rock in 1452, a document that codifies practices that presumably had been in play in some form already in the decades in which the Getty and NYPL Bill Plunkin were created. And now I add in at the left the frontispiece of a printed copy of this ordinance uh, from the 18th century, just to reference the codification of midwife practices and indeed their longevity. As well as the on the right, a 16th century book on midwifery. The image here, with its flurry of activity, evokes the very urgent and often dangerous procedures with life or death stakes with which midwives were entrusted. So this ordinance that was written in Regensburg in 1452 stipulates that all female inhabitants of the city are entitled to the services of a midwife, and that for those too poor to afford one, costs would be covered by the municipal administration, so Medicaid 15th century style. According to the ruling, midwives are to be measured in their intake of wine and mead, and they are to remain on hand to assist new mothers in the weeks after childbirth, among other stipulations. Particularly noteworthy is the fact that Although the city brought had ultimate jurisdiction, Regensburg's midwives answered directly to a collectivity called the Honorable Women, the Erban Frauen. The women of this council typically were from the high ranking families of the city, the wives or widows of the merchants and entrepreneurs who profited with the economic expansion of the 14th and early 15th century, and who's the, those men who served in the city of the municipal council. So these are the wives of those city councilmen. In short, the leading men and women of Ravensburg, each in their distinct spheres, were entrusted with overseeing, respectively, the governance of the urban streets for the men and the practicalities of the domestic realm for the women. The vision of Nero at the birthing bed in the NYPL manuscript is in tune with late medieval ideals for handling the business of childbirth, even if, as in this case, the players invert the expected workings of nature. So yes, for sure, we do see here a man who has given birth, and his baby is not a child but a toad. But I also note that that toad there is not green or in the bluish hue that is found throughout this manuscript, but rather it is pink. It actually looks not unlike a newborn baby squirming its way into the world. The visualization of Nero's parturition in the Getty manuscript, however, emphasizes the aberrance of Nero's son. And suggests that things could get chaotic at the birthing bed. Here, the ruler seems to have been utterly exhausted by the delivery. He slinks into the sheets, bare-chested and with mouth agape. 
a lady at the right fluffs Nero's pillow, and neither of them seems to pay much of mind to the newborn toad, convincingly ear rendered in green and black, and cradled in a barrel like bassinet by the blonde youth in the left foreground. The accompanying Belconic verses suggest that the doctors did not put much thought into engaging a particularly adept nurse to help Nero with the newborn. The text specifies that after the toad child was brought to the emperor, a nurse was called in quickly, it these bots, and that rather than assert, asserting his expectation for the care she would provide the newborn, Nero offered to make her rich beyond measure on Maz and Gita. The gold leaf of Nero's crown in the Getty illumination underscores the emphasis on riches over reliability. And the mood is agitated with heated mutterings of the still present band of doctors, one of whom attends to Nero and three of whom engage in a discussion over what they have wrought. Concern for the status of the totally child indicated by the downward pointing fingers of the men in red and white at the left edge of the composition. Nothing in the Velconi text indicates the words that may be passing between those two pointing men, but we can speculate about how some reader viewers cir circa 1400 might have considered the newborn. For toads were a mainstay of the healing arts from antiquity to the early modern era in Europe. Cries, along with serpents and lizard lizards, were as therapeutic agents. And 14th and 15th century Middle High German medical manuscripts especially recommended pulverized toad as an antidote to poison. Such uses for toads probably were not far from the minds of these manuscripts' original audiences. But as reader viewers of these illuminated Velkonikin turned the pages of their manuscripts, encountering the next episode in the text, Issues medical faded from relevance in favor of larger questions of imperial pomposity and culpability. For the subsequent episodes in the tale underscore Nero's preoccupation with the glamour of parenthood over and above the practicalities. And in keeping with distinctions in pictorial tone found in the NYPL and Getty manuscripts, the illuminations in the two codices vary in their presentation of the nurse's responsibility for Nero Jr. So back to the story, and now I focus on the NYTL manuscript. Soon after giving birth, Nero undertakes plans to celebrate his amphibian son at a large feast. On the day of the celebration, Nero has his toad child conveyed to the festivities in a cart. As the cortege crosses a bridge, however, the lad hears the songs of other toads and heeds the call of his beastly nature, leaping out of the carriage and sliding down a ladder into the muddy waters below, unnoticed by the nurse. And this is a text on the screen. Do kuk zi uf den leiter baum, des nam dief arme do nit baum, zi bor du nida hin zi kau, in das wasser in a schau. In the teeth of the border, when the dark days in Zorba. In this image in the New York manuscript, the toad emerges from a barrel-like coach through a hatch. If the rendering holds anyone culpable for neglecting to oversee the imperial progeny, it would seem to be the figure at the right, the richly clothed driver described in the text. The Getty image of this episode, however, is overt in ascribing blame. Here, the illumination underscores the goods of Nero's party in honor of a toad. Janska Enigel's text describes a carriage made of silver with wheels of gold, drawn by a deer and traversing a road paved with precious stones. In this image, the pomp of the moment comes across through the depiction of musicians at the left, blasting trumpets and banging on drums, and through the luxury coach, fashioned from shimmering gold and pierced with an ogival arched window, heavily crocketed and capped by a finial. 
Out of this window leans the maid. She almost seems to be tossing her young charge from the carriage. And we see the little guy leap down out of the world of the imperial retinue and into the foggy waters below. A detail of the maid's accoutrement marked her as blameworthy, perhaps the kind of treacherous attendance that one who is as base as Nero deserves. The elements to which I refer are the fluffy hood that frames the lady's head and the white tufts encircling her shoulders. These accessories were called clusula or ruffles, and they were particularly in fashion in the decades toward the end of the 14th century and the beginning of the 15th in the German region. Now, there are instances where this mode of adornment is found on ladies being honored in Ursula bust reliquaries and tomb effigies and other sculptures as you see on the screen. But in the genre of illuminated belt clothing, fluffy trim around the face and ruffles at the collar frequently are used to designate the disloyal or the degenerate, as in the images now on the screen. In the upper left, we've got lustful idolaters in a scene of the ancient Israelites. And then moving on clockwise, there is Delilah cutting Samson's hair. And after her, an untrustworthy girlfriend of Alexander the Great, who will soon let go of the chain that holds his diving bell. And finally, a woman who betrays Virgil and is punished by having her genitalia set aflame and then used to light the torches of the Romans. So from these, you also get a sense of the whole range of kinds of images one finds and one's being made to start from. Jans's telling of the Nero story makes plain the blameworthiness of the nurse who kind of checks out during the carriage ride over the bridge, allowing the toad to leap toward his kinsmen or kin's toads when she should have been protecting him. This is what happens when the lady is entrusted with caring for a newborn neglect their responsibilities, a kind of negative exemplar. But it also might be a restoration of order. The text emphasizes that the toad absconds to join his brethren, the other croaking creatures of the swamp, taking Nero's son out of the realm of the palace and into nature, where he belongs. Nero, for his part, is shown to deserve no parental empathy. At the news of the loss of his son, he gets so enraged that he orders the beheadings of 50 princes he has been holding hostage and commands the execution of the nurse. In the pages of the manuscripts and in the urban sphere, relief is granted and harmony prevails. In the Getty and NYPL codices, after the tale of Nero, reader viewers could turn the page, moving forward with narratives that offer rather placid accounts of the story of Joachim and Anna, the parents of the Virgin Mary, and of Elijah's miracles, respectively. And in Ravensburg, the audiences for such tales could look up and find comfort in the fact that theirs was a domain remote from the ravages of impetuous imperial rule. Indeed, during the period in which the Getty and NYPL manuscripts were created, the citizens of Regensburg could even shrug off the very idea of imperial authority. Not only had the burghers of the city from the 13th century on enjoyed special privileges for governance and trade independent of the empire and the ecclesiastical hierarchy and the regional nobility, but also in the first decade of the 15th century, there was no clear successor to the emperor's throne at all. And here now is an image of the Regensburg Rathaus, the city hall, um, at the left and at the right, a Belconic image of an enthroned ruler, actually the pharaoh from the Exodus story, from the Getty manuscript, just to evoke that urban imperial opposition. That is, so in the span from 1400 to 1410, when these two manuscripts were made, this was a decade when imperial authority was in disarray. The Luxembourg heir to Emperor Charles IV, Venceslaus, had governed from Prague as king of Bohemia and Germany since the late 1370s, but had never been crowned Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope. And when Venceslaus was deposed in 1400, 
The man chosen as successor, the Dittelsbach Ruprecht von, Ruprecht von der Fox, faced such resistance within the German realm that he could not enter the city of Aachen for his coronation, and his authority was always contested by the rival Luxembourg line. Back in the streets of Regensburg, it was the men of the city rocked, the entrepreneurs and merchants who profited immensely from trade along the Danube River, and the women who orchestrated the births and early lives of the city's new citizens who called the shots. When members of these communities left the public sphere and retreated to their downtown mansions, they could find diversion and assurance in Belconi tales of wayward rulers and incompetent nurses getting their due. Nestled in with the comforts of city life, they could celebrate the promise of a bright tomorrow, where newborns are ushered into a well-ordered urban realm and where doctors, tradespeople, and other professionals assume the pinnacles of power. I'm gonna, um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna write a note for the people watching it online that they can ask a question. And of course, anyone in the audience can ask a question as well. Yeah, what in that um, slide where you had the names of the authors? Yeah. What, there was a banderole with an effaced piece of, what, do you know what that? The banderole didn't have any text on it. I mean, the image bit, was- the end. Like to me, it looked like it was erased. Like oh well, it's well, we can go back to it. Yeah, it's nope. not unusual. Um, I don't know how I'm here. Oh, um, go back. It's, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. Oh, like you want to get back to your. Okay. It'll just it'll say the letter. But um, it's not unusual for these manuscripts because the I mean it's a water based paint. Um, so that if they get wet, they stain. So where where's the? At the end, it looks like there's some text. Oh, oh yeah, it looks like it's like somebody wrote Joe. What is it? <laughs> no, um, I don't know what that is. It does look like somebody wrote on it afterward, that it, but it wasn't there initially. Like this is an example of a speech scroll where you can, like it stands in for him dictating. Yeah, so it looks like the, well, whatever it was there was smeared out. It's like well done. It actually looks like it was added later. Like that's not part of the oh. illumination, oh, okay. and it's not in the same hand as the the manuscript is is written. So it's like a later owner like put their initials in it. Oh. But what's cool in this image too is you can see the scribe there, and he's got he's got a knife in one hand to erase, and the pen in the other to do the writing, because this is on parchment, which is you know forgiving the way you correct it. The way you erase is great. I, I had a question for you, Nina. You were talking in the end about, um, here, I'll put you on, on screen here. Uh, you were talking in the end about kind of the specific audience that was, that was you, you talked in the middle about the audience that was for, and then you were talking in the end about kind of what they were receiving from it. And before you started your lecture, we were talking about different ways that people process picture stories um, from this time period and how they might process them now. And we were kind of talking about how they might now be more information laced or, or more direct and maybe in the past an idea that they might be more open in interpretation. You gave this very interesting discussion of kind of like a, an optimistic tone that this class of people could take from them. How how are they, um, how, how do you think that people were processing these stories? Were they satirical? Were they kind of, if, if they were, if they had a certain kind of thing that they were trying to express, how open was that thing or, or how direct was it? Well, I think I, they, I, there are parts that are satirical. That is, there are particularly the sections of text that were written by Janste Eniko. Those are the ones that are the most bawdy and like filled with dialogue. Then, as I said, there are these, these manuscripts are complicated to work on because the texts in them are like collaged and no two manuscripts have the same actual sequence of texts. Um, they have like pieces from these different authors. Right. Um, and so the sections that were written by this guy called the Chris Terra poet, those are the most churchy. Like he was actually, like he has been identified as a figure um, and he was a cleric, he was a priest. Um, and so there are portions 
that even are, you know, written, like the text is kind of pious in its tone, but you can still have illuminations that are sort of bawdy um, or sort of like, sort of, I don't know, winky, jokey. Um, some of the illuminations are sort of straightforward, but, you know, in more sort of traditional iconography is a particularly things that are telling biblical stories. Um, but there is a lot of experimentation in these and a lot of uh, sort of image, like the images do a lot of the interpreting and they, you know, sort of what I said in the talk is what I believe really strongly is these were made to be amusing. Right, so it seems more more amusing and entertainment rather than instructive or or moralizing. Yeah, for sure. This is this is like what they're thinking about when they're not going to church. Yeah. There's some. Yeah. So you were also saying this is sort of one little piece of a uh, well, sorry. You started by talking about how sort of people are now revisiting the revising, and I'm wondering whether how this. These particular things you've shown, and forgive me if you said it, and I'm just putting it together, uh, I just failed to put it together. Um, whether these, this stuff is at odds with, um, I guess I'm not clear on how much this stuff is at odds with other representations of Mira, and also how these things stand in relationship to the whole, the rehabilitation. Yeah. And if also, if you see any kind of um, logic for for why? Because uh, I know, for example, there's also someone else who is also being rehabilitated now. Richard is that Richard Third? Yeah, the one, the one who. I thought you were going to say Richard Nixon. No, no, no. <laughs> Richard the Third. No, is it, it's Richard the yeah. Third, right? Who is the hunchback and, and exactly. is understood now that some portion of that um, negative stuff came from the fact that he was hunchback. Uh, anyway, uh, and I, anyway, sorry. So I don't know whether you sort of. Um, in that case, they do actually sort of see a way in which there's a factual reason, you know. Yeah. And, and anyway, I don't know if, if what you see. If, if, I'm sorry, I said a lot of people don't have this. No, there's a there's a great question, and I um the you know the simple answer is this stuff is not part of the um efforts that have been made among people who study classics to discern what people actually thought about Nero in his day. I mean, the, the, I mean, the reason I introduced that is because, you know, first of all, Nero is a figure who people think of as a shorthand for like, oh, naughty, bad, bad ruler, fiddle to it while we're he's just like, and there has been this recent um, push among people who study, you know, ancient Roman, you know, first century Roman things. So, but my point with that is they have this whole exhibition at the British Museum about like, and people actually liked him in his day. Um, and the headlines, like nobody could understand it. I mean, yeah, it was, it was, it was a successful show, but people have this resistance, like that, you know, they've been taught that Nero is this one thing. And so, but what I wanted to do, like the reason I introduced that to set this up is to set up that, you know, what you think of, as you know, what what we all think we know of as the Nero stories isn't what people through all time thought of as the Nero stories. Like, probably most of you didn't think of Nero as somebody who got pregnant and gave birth to a toad. Like, this is a tradition that is totally faded out. Um, and so that that was all I was trying to do by bringing that in is like to set up the sort of uh, an understanding that there's a variety of ways these historical narratives get told. But is there has anyone discerned a kind of whether connected logic in terms of of um, why Nero, why the particular sort of imaginings of him there were? You know what I mean? Or, or why he became the bad guy? Or, or should we assume from this that uh, the same was true of other? Um, I mean, or is that too too big a question? Yeah, it's, I mean, that's a question for classicists. The reason the people who wrote it, like, in the second century, in the generations after he died, were enemies of him and his family. And so they concocted all these things. I mean, he might have done some weird things, but a lot of, a lot of Roman emperors did weird, naughty things. Um, but he has come to stand for naughtiness incarnate. And has he been understood, though, to have, have carved up his mother? That's a legend. 
yeah 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 and just i mean and also that he you know he whatever yeah that's something that the audiences of these illuminated manuscripts would have been aware of prior to them being created like these stories about nero putting up his mother or giving birth to his mother is that something the audience would have already been familiar with or are they being revealed we can't know. I mean, the thing there are probably oral traditions, right, that informed Janska and Ekel when he wrote this. I mean, there are things in his text that there is there are no textual sources for, and all we can say is either he made them up or there was an oral like tradition. It's just really, yeah, like the inventiveness of it is really fascinating. And then, like, also kind of non sequitur, but the way they contextualize these stories in the garb of the day. Like, I was kind of wondering, is that because I assume they have to know something about these people that they're writing the stories about, right? They have to know what Romans look like. So when they decide to dress them in, you know, nice armor or something like that, is that because they are consciously contextualizing it for their audience? Or is it because... They're like, oh, he's a king. This is what kings look like. It's both and. Okay. I mean, it's just the way, if you look at 15th century devotional paintings, like if you look at images of like the Virgin Mary, like at the Annunciation, when Angel Gabriel comes to her and tells her she's going to give birth, she's dressed like a 15th century woman. That, that's, that was just the practice, right? And it wasn't seen as disjunctive. If you look at Bibles from the 13th century, the, you know, the Israelites fighting in Jericho have, you know, mail on, they look like 13th century soldiers. Um, so that's the answer, but not in all cases or in all ways. Like sometimes like the Israelites here, you know, actually not in the example I showed you, but there are other ones where they're just like in robes, you know? <laughs> so they don't, they're always, they're not always in the fashions of the day, but sometimes they are. Someone online named Jesse has a question. You describe the poetic text as uh, designed for oral recitation. Uh, do you think these images also have a performative role? For sure. I mean, I, I imagine that um, people would sit around in the evening, like after dinner, and somebody, there would be someone in the family or in the household who is good at reading, there often is, and they would read out loud and people would look at the pictures with them. Um, and, you know, there's there's one scholar who works on these who does think there's a connection to theater and that the sort of the big gestures in the images might echo or in some way, you know, sort of crystallize the kinds of gestures that would be used in a more of a dramatic performance. There, um, I, it's, it's, uh, to, it's impossible to prove, but I think that that is a, it's, it's logical to think that that, that is likely. Someone asked if there was time to ask a question. So Lisa, if you want to ask your question. Yes. I was um, just writing back to her saying there was time. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Maybe she's typing right now. Maybe someone in the audience has another question. How long did it take to produce these books? You said they're pretty. It's impossible. We don't know. Really. These are made in, in workshops and it's really the sort of the um, practices for production of manuscripts, particularly in Germany, have not been researched at all. People know a lot about the way manuscripts were created in like in in France in centers like Paris, particularly, like there's one street of the scribes and there's another street of the illuminators. And so, and there were overseers who were called like, you know, libraires, like book guy, um, who would be like a producer and like, and sort of they would contract the parchment and then they would get the parchment pages to the, the, the and so they were made in sort of piecemeal. And we don't, we don't know if these were made in that way, or it's there's actually more evidence in just in my looking at these that the texts were copied and illuminated in the same workshops. But we don't know how many, I mean, you can, in each one of these, you can discern how many hands there are and how many different illuminators there are. But we don't know if they, like how many hours a day there were. It depends if it's winter, you have fewer daylight hours. So we don't know. And it just depends on how many people are in a workshop. I'm going to unmute Lisa and she's going to ask this question. I've got it. 
Okay. Um, let me just turn up the volume so people here can hear. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay. Thank you, um, Professor Rowe, for this talk. It was um, super interesting. I actually had a question because you mentioned, for instance, that in portrayals of crusaders, um, soldiers of Jerusalem are portrayed in male. This is the kind of thing that I work on in relation to modern superhero comics. And one of the things that comes up in my research is how the illuminations are planned. So what I mean by that is for the ones that you're looking at with the Nero story specifically, do you know if they were interpretive images? So are they images that the artist sort of read the text and then drew based on interpretive moves? Or do they seem to be rubricated images? So there was sort of the overseer giving the rubric for what would go in each image, which doesn't always align, especially in printed uh, material with the text itself. I was just wondering if you could talk about that. That's a great question also about production. And some of these manuscripts still have instructions to the illuminators, but they don't, they're not so precise. They say something like here, have a guy lying in bed, you know, um, but sometimes then, the, those instructions to illuminators can then later be underlined like in red. So they serve as a caption for once the book is complete, which is kind of cool. Or sometimes that when they're on paper and then sometimes they're scraped out. But the thing is there were, it's clear that people did pass around, you know, examples of these as models. That is you see elements that are consistent. Like I showed you that sort of disturbing image of the, um, the the maid by the bed with her eyes popping out. It's like, oh my goodness, there's a toad. And but it's the same formula that you saw in the more like serene image um, in the NYPL manuscript. So those, that's a case where there it seems like people are using common models. But um, and there might be you know certain examples of these you know manuscripts like the the Getty one where there are other people are looking at it to for formulas for the different scenes. What's really unusual about um, with this corpus of material is the wide variety in style, um, pictorial style. In part, this has to do with the two media, that is paper is something that only starts to be produced in Germany in 1380. And after 1380, the majority, the majority of illuminated uh, Veltkoniken that are produced in Bavaria and Austria after 1380, the majority are on paper. But the styles on paper are not all the same. Some of them are really scratchy. Some of them are looser than the example that I gave you. And then, on, so you have those on the one hand, but then you also have the traditional medium of parchment with tempera paint. And those have more like heavily, those look more like other things um, that were made in that time and place. So it's an unusual case where you have a genre of manuscript where there are like, so the iconographies can be similar, but the style are really, really different. Thank you so much. There's a either there's a there's another question here, unless someone in the audience wanted to break in with a question, I can ask this one here. Um, Kelsey asks, were these commissioned by burgers? Are they made up to uphold the opinion of the burgeoning middle class in that way to continue to push out an emperor, an idea many religious people uh, may want since he was appointed by the Pope, right, and not a merchant municipal worker. Uh, and then they corrected the Holy Roman Empire, I mean. Yeah, right, right. So I, I'm, I think what you're asking is about how these were commissioned and who for whom they were commissioned. And they, they're, the bits of evidence that we have about, we don't have for any of them, this was commissioned by blah, you know, but that we, but they did, there are elements of the, both the texts and then the images that sort of tether them to the world of these expanding cities. I mean, that is my argument that I, and there's good evidence for that. Um, there's no, there's only one case where it seems that a, a Veltkonik, illuminated Veltkonik manuscript was owned by a cleric, someone who was connected to the church. They're kind of anti-clerical in tone in parts, not entirely. I mean, these are people who lived in a world that was governed by an understanding of Christianity. And some of them 
have stories of, you know, little Jesus and his mom. Nonetheless, it's really, they're not the stories that you expect when you're thinking about the, you know, the virgin and the Christ child. Like they're really like, Jesus, who's like 11 years old and hanging out with his friends, like kills one of them accidentally. There's like, there's a lot of stuff like that. They're, they're very anecdotal. Maybe actually, I, maybe I should get clarification on this, because I'm sure it's something you mentioned in the talk. But, you know, of course, the illuminated manuscripts I'm familiar with are, you know, it's an, they're, they're, they're administered, I would assume, by the church, they're, they're held and these, if they're for more common people, it's an addition of one. They're not for a private household, correct? I mean, they, no, they okay, are they are. Private household. Wow, okay. They're, yeah. And so illuminated manuscripts, I mean, just like a, like the briefest history. Yes. For, I mean, to, uh, medieval illuminated manuscripts initially were made either in mostly in monastic houses and in sort of court ateliers. And that's what you have like from the 9th to the 11th, 12th century. In the 12th century, still you have a lot of manuscripts that are, again, made they're, they're for use for, you know, the divine office, for the mass, that they're illuminated Bibles, they're sacred, they're Christian. Um, in the um, 12th century, you still have a lot of manuscripts made in monasteries, but you start to have professional illuminators. And it's in the 13th century where you have the professionalization of you have the movement of production out of monasteries into cities. And that's where you have what I was talking about, about that piecemeal production, right. where you have a street of the illuminators in Paris and the street of the parchment makers, street of the, you know, whatever scribes. Um, and so that is professional. That's not, it has nothing to do with the church. Right, okay. Um, but you still have things made also. I mean, you, it's a both and at that point. And these are examples, though, of, and you also have a lot of manuscripts made at royal, like, tippy top at uh, courts, like the, the court of the King of France or the court of the, you know, Holy Roman Empire. Most of the ones that we have preserved would be in that in that genre that, yeah those and those are the ones that most people know right and that's why i was delighted when i discovered this genre of manuscript where there's not not one of them seems to have been held by a, a high-ranking prince there's some lower nobles but there there are a lot of nobility you know and like you know whatever the count of you know this like i don't know small valley um in particularly in 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 Austria, you know. But um, so that's what these are like up, upper tier burgers and lower nobles. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And what relationship do these have to, I know Rapunzel, for example, draws a relation or then represents um, the development of, of actually some sequential visual narratives in com early comic strip. But in Germany, I think exclusively, yeah, certainly not in England. So is this, would these have been coming out of, um, the streets you were talking about where one street is the scribes, one street is the, uh, if you happen to know. Um, were they, well, we don't know about the production of the, like the particulars of production of the middle high German manuscripts or, or things made in Bavaria and Austria. There's been a lot of research in Paris, for instance, about the, the, the division of labor. Yeah, I have one. Yeah. Is it in the little bits you read that it, that it's na it's narration, but is there also like dialogue before? Yep. Well, was that is that dialogue? Some of the bit that was dialogue. And how is that differentiated? Right? There's no. You just have to know. I mean, it's just the context. Thing you read was. I, there was one where I left in quotation marks because it was so I, important, but a lot of other ones were also so parts of dialogue so between the two narration. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say the dominant mode? In, yeah. I, I would say the dominant mode is narration, but it's Janster Enikel. He throws in a lot of dialogue. Same uh, kind of language, the same uh, yeah. kind of drama. Yeah. And you say you would have to know, would people reading it at the time be aware in the chip? The, 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 he said, blah, oh. you know, it's like. He introduces the dialogue. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so spoke Nero, you know.
Thank you. A lot of, I read a lot of early puppet shows were just narrated by someone at the puppets when I when I to the dumb show. Yeah. So this was this kind of kind of uh, theater without dialogue. There's a comment of were you going to There's a comment from comic scholar uh, I.K. Exner, and he says, "For anyone interested in the world of these illuminated manuscripts, I have an unconventional recommendation: the recent video game Pentiment, which deals with illuminated manuscript production in 1500s Bavaria. In case Nina is familiar with it, I've led to know what she thinks of its representation of that world." I, you know what? I know I, I am aware of it. I really appreciate that. Um, that comment and I'm aware of it and I sort of I glanced over it because because it was like and it seemed good but I'm not like a gamer I, I haven't given it a lot of attention but it's a cool thing that it exists and I think they they know what they're doing pretty well I mean and there are other scholars of illuminated manuscripts who think it's dynamite so that's a nice all right that's a nice note to end to okay. end things on I think Thank you so much, Thank Nina. You. And I'll just say to people watching online and people here next week, we have John Porcelino will be um, will be doing the symposium. Thanks, everybody. Bye. And, and bye to you guys as well. But you guys can stay and, and relax.